Tapper friends, why does Shale Bridge Cradle have such a reputation over the years? How scary is it really? No thanks, bro. Since the release of Thief Deadly Shadows in 2004, the reputation of Shale Bridge has grown to a legendary status. There's been a number of articles just about the level itself, including a very long, thorough article from PC Gamer. We'll link to them below. It's one of the few video game levels that has its own dedicated Wikipedia page. Some other ones include All Gillied Up from Modern Warfare and An Orlando from Dark Souls. Now, this wasn't the first foray of horror into this Thief series. Thief 1 had some fantastic horror levels like Bone Horde or Return to Cathedral, but what has it been about Shalebridge Cradle has made it stand out more than the others? Let's dive into it. We'll go through a recap of the level first, my Taffer friends, and then we'll break down what makes it so great, what makes it so atmospheric, so scary, and we'll also break down the story and the implications that are given that we piece together throughout the level. I've never robbed an orphanage before, and I can't say I'm looking forward to this visit. There's no telling what I'll find inside. I'm used to the dark, but this feels like a house with bad dreams. Shalebridge Cradle served as a mental asylum and a orphanage, and after a fire, it was eventually shut down. That's not menacing at all, is it? We start outside and we first descend our way in and there's no one around. This is a very different change of pace than other Thief games. We're always dealing with enemies, but there is nothing here, at least for the first half. On that note, that doesn't mean it's any less frightening. If anything, that notion of not seeing what's actually there is far more frightening. We have the fantastic sound design as always to help drive this atmosphere home. Firstly, we have to go find a spare fuse to get this thing up and running. These sounds, my goodness. Oh, and here's the jump floaty glitch that loves to break the atmosphere we're in. Ah, uh, good stuff. Ah, uh, talking backwards. That's never not creepy, is it? Here's some notes about heat therapy using dry heat to help the patients here. What could possibly go wrong with that? What's that knocking? So we make our way up to the attic where the knocking comes from, and we get the fuse. But as we're up here, we find this painting, and Garrett makes note of how it looks like the translator girl from The Keepers. Then we hear a voice of a young girl, and it's creepy as always. I can hear you breathing. Nobody here in the cradle does that anymore. How did you get in? My name is Laurel. Something changed when you saw my picture. That's why you can hear me now. Her name is Laurel, and she could help us out with what we're doing here, but we need to help her out as well. See, once the cradle has a hold on people, it doesn't like to let go. So that's what we're going to help her out with. Interesting fact, the voice actress for Laurel is the same person who did the voice of Victoria in the previous two thieves, and Shodan from System Shock. Never would have guessed without looking that up. Drain pipe, so it will end up outside. It's important. The plants there could sustain a reaction large enough to destroy everything. We're off back to the basement that we were in earlier to get a vial of her blood. We also make use of this fuse box to get things up and running here. It's still creepy even though we have some lights now. In the room where we get this vial of blood, Laurel mentions this cage where they put people in. That's the cage where they used to put the new patients until a cell opened up. You should stay out of there, or the cradle might see you and try to keep you here forever. 
I'm sure that's not going to come up later. After dropping the vial of blood, it turns out we need to do a bit more than just that to help get her spirit out, so we're off to go get her nightgown. We head further into the cradle, and we walk past what is the exercise yard. And there's just something really unsettling about this place, how it's not very detailed, and there's it's all barred up. What was that I just saw in the background? Oh boy. At the front desk, we get information about the nine patients in the white hall. Got just a quick little summary about the nine patients. I will come back to this later in the story section, which I will timestamp below. Now we have some flickering lights. That's not dubious at all. Now, of course, flickering lights is a age-old cliche or trope in horror, but it works for a good reason. It actually later occurred to me when lights are flickering, that means certain enemies are around. Well, let's start taking a gander through these nine chambers, shall we? Here's chamber number one, and we go up here. Very secluded. All right, let's keep going. Oh, there's a problem here is you're going to be doing a lot of lock picking, which I was never great in this game. And hey, the lights are flickering. What's that noise? So these creatures on this level are known as the puppets. They're by far the most terrifying enemies we encounter throughout the entire series of Thief. What's interesting is I didn't make note of and found out later is that there are only nine of them, but it makes sense. Nine patients, nine puppets. I'd recommend making use of mines or holy water, fire arrows to get rid of them and get them out of your way. The last thing you wanna be doing is lock picking and then hearing one of them where the lights start flickering. That's not very fun. Let's go through these rooms. We have patient number two. Has some utensils there. There's a note about sneaking into the kitchen and he was the fat man. Patient number three, we have these very strange chains in here and we have this very ominous candle. Patient number four here looks pretty ordinary. We got some clock gears, not much really to say there. Patient number five though, I find one of the more unsettling ones. Firstly, this is where we find Laurel's nightgown. What it's doing here, who really knows? Laurel makes note that patient five was blamed for her death, punished, even though it wasn't him. Actually, I accidentally did not go into patient number six's room while recording this. But this is one where she carries around her baby as ashes, so maybe that's for the best, because that's really unsettling to me. Patient number seven is hanging out in their room. Oh boy. Oh jeez. Patient number eight. Ah, the sounds of crackling music dying. That's never not creepy at all. Patient number nine. This sounds like someone's on fire. Very unsettling. Again, we'll come back to this later and break down more patient by patient and who they are. Check the timestamp for more. Now that we have her nightgown, we must head down to the morgue to burn it. This moment here is one of the creepiest moments in any game I've ever seen. This puppet gyrating on the ground, with the lights flickering. Once I saw a man in one of the basins, all wrapped up in wet bandages. He heard me come in and started making screaming noises. I think he wanted me to help him, but I was too afraid. We can make our way into the treatment room here. We could get the scalpel. We could read some more about these lobotomies and how they're going to learn from the botches. Very dark stuff. And it sounds like some of them have the skill set of Dr. Nick Riviera. And we burn Laurel's nightgown and we're free, right? No, nope, we still got more to do. So now we have to go back to the past. And to do so, we have to grab an item from one of the patients and take it to an area that was described in the book that we saw earlier. So now we're back in the past and now we have quote unquote normal enemies to deal with. Now, if you get caught by them, it will take you back to the present and you have to go find another item from a different patient. But through my playthrough, I did this without needing to do that. And it didn't result in any safe scumming. Don't worry, I would never do something like that since I did a whole video on it, would I? <laughs> Ayy, while these enemies take after normal guards, 
The appearance, the backwards talking is utterly terrifying. And you have no gear to deal with them. So if you get caught, you're back to the present. We have to head upstairs to get Laurel's diary. Whose idea was it to put a mental asylum with a orphanage? Really, did the city not have enough funds? Wasn't there enough room for it? They couldn't think of anything better to do. Getting the diary of Laurel up here is very tense, even though there's just this one guard and their patterns. It is very tense. We go back to the morgue and burn the diary. Finally, now we have to deal with the blood stains that are in the attic. And to deal with that, we need to get some disillusion serum. That's not sounding morbid at all. We go back to the surgery room, and even though the guard does not move, this is one of the most tense moments I've ever played in any game. Slowly creeping my way over. Please don't turn around, please don't turn around, just let me take this and go, thank you very much. Now we got passed by the exercise yard again to get back to the attic. These enemies just sitting here in the chairs are just so tense this atmosphere creates. Is it dark enough here? I'm just going to take my time and go very slowly. Now that we use the serum, Laurel can make her way out of here and her ghost form starts to make her way out. She says to meet us at the lobby where we can get some snacks and she makes her escape and we do- Oh, you didn't think it'd be that easy, did you? Well, turns out for being in here for too long now that Shale Bridge Credo remembers us. So now we're going to have to do some interesting things here. We're going to have to trick it in thinking that we have died. So we have to head back to the basement and in that cage that Laurel mentioned earlier, we have to get in it. Oh dear, no thank you. So now we have to head to the very top and jump out of the tower and commit suicide to trick the cradle into letting us go. Now let's head up to the staff tower which is accessible to us. We have weapons now, we could deal with these guys. I'd rather not- Oh, shoot, I got caught. Let's fight- Oh, 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 okay. Well, that- That kind of took me out of it, but all right. We take this long elevator ride up. I love how more of this ending is. You could see that open window. Here's a few people at the table, and let's jump out. And we're done with Shale Bridge Cradle. So why does Shale Bridge Cradle work so well in comparison to some of the other horror levels that popped up in Thief 1? Well, in the video I did about comparing Thief 1 and Thief 2, I said one of Thief 1's greatest strengths and greatest weaknesses can be the sprawling, maze-like nature of the levels. Here, Shalebridge Cradle is very tightly packed. Compare that to something like Return to Cathedral or the Bone Horde, where there is so much in that sprawling design that's very easy to get lost. Also to note is Thief Deadly Shadows is a very good game, but not an all-time classic like Thief 1 and Thief 2. Thief 1 and Thief 2 had a number of cases of just banger after banger after banger when it comes to levels, and while Thief Deadly Shadows is still a very good game, it is a noticeable step down, and there is a build up to this. This is the second last level in the game. So to have the rug pulled from underneath us and more at dealing with a level where there is very few enemies to deal with, especially in the first half where there is none, definitely creates an interesting atmosphere and change. Jordan Thomas, the level designer behind the cradle, had this to say about it. The first half of robbing the cradle is a little exotic for a thief mission that there are no AI enemies to haunt you. You are just hunted by sounds. You're hunted by what you imagine coming after you. The more the environment can suggest than state, the more spare cycles you have to mentally scare yourself. People would imagine whatever they found to be most menacing. Thief has an incredible reputation for its sound design and here it is no slouch and it's probably the game at its best. The unsettling music that goes in the background, all the backwards talking, all the various sound effects, a lot of implications that we could dive more into with all the notes scattered about. And let's take a look into it because once we piece this together, that's where it starts to get really unsettling. The story really starts to unfold here. So to begin with, what happens with Laurel is she was murdered by an old hag who ends up being the antagonist of the game, which greatly upset the patient Patients. Now the doctors in charge actually punished a couple of the individual patients even though they were not responsible for it. Later there was a fire started in the building and then it was abandoned and what we have left now are the ghosts in the time of Shalebridge Cradle holding these people here. Throughout the level we get some various notes about some of the stuff that the doctor is doing in regards to submerging in water or heat therapy 
or lobotomy. So we're able to derive some stuff from these patients through the book in the main hallway, giving a little summary about them, going into their cell, and more detailed notes that we could pick up throughout the level. So patient number one, who is in the seclusion chamber, goes by the name King No One. He was the perpetrator of the infamous Tallow Man murders, which is a very unsettling name. He was a natural leader and was decided to be kept in seclusion. He tricked some staff into taking some of his own medication, resulting in some death. He was punished for Laurel's death, even though he was not responsible. Patient number two, with the nickname Gourmet, heavily implied that they're accountable, doesn't outright stay it, but enough's there to put two and two together. Needs to be escorted into the meal hall, permitted. This individual is found by officers eating a meal of questionable origin. What a great term. So what they do, they keep them well fed at all times. Only blunt utensils are available for him. Patient number three with the unlit candle has episodes of sleepwalking into the morgue. This individual is highly suspected for murder. This patient deals with the water treatments of submerging. Patient number four, the one with the clockworking tools, is allowed to perform repairs in the shock therapy room. They were permitted to shale bridge after a nervous episode, probably not a danger to themselves. However, patient accidentally was given electrical treatments with unfortunate consequences which heavily damaged him. Who hires these people? Patient number five is one of the more disturbing ones. He was one who was punished. He was believed to have killed Laurel even though that was not the case. I do wonder why he has her nightgown. He was admitted to the facility after a woman was attacked during a portrait sitting. If we go up to the observatory, we could see a number of his paintings with a hand mark over the faces. From the details we get, he attacks people if they move when he does his portrait. Now, if you're up in the attic, you could see the painting of Laurel, and you, you could find a note about Laurel talking about the painting, saying she was scared to say no, but I guess she did it right because he said, I sat good and still. Patient number six carries the urn of her ashes of what's assumed to be her own infant. She's allowed to carry the urn out in the exercise yard but she has been approved for experimental heat therapy. Oh boy. Patient number seven, the one that we could find in their room, completely in response to the questions of the presence of others due to her quote-unquote sensitive age, whatever that means. Her cell is outfitted in the same manner as the murder scene where she was found. Patient number eight was admitted to the hospital by her late husband's family, wanted to avoid the scandal of a murder trial. Now it became clear that she came from a very rich family, recommended that no glass or mirrors in her cell. A lot of vague details here, which allows us to paint some pictures in their mind, which is far more horrifying than any straight out story could. Patient number nine found present the scene of several fatal fires. It seemed that though she was slight and unintelligent would be capable of such arson, it appeared she was. For good behavior, she's allowed to light the fire in the lounge. Now, if we're going to piece things together of who would have started the fire, most likely would have been patient number nine. We could piece together these details to kind of get a feel for what happened, but there are still a lot of things that are up in the air and up to interpretation, and that's far scarier than if the details were utterly laid out for us. Whenever I look at these articles or people talk about the cradle, I always find this aspect of the story tends to get a little overlooked in comparison to the enemies or the atmosphere, which are all fantastic. But the implications, again, of putting together this story that we find throughout is part of the horror factor that comes and makes the Shale Bridge Cradle such a classic. So my Taffer friends, I hope you enjoyed that trip down memory lane in regards to the Shale Bridge Cradle, one of the greatest levels ever designed, and a masterstroke of horror design. I do have some videos I've done on Thief and other related games like Thief, like Gloomwood or Dishonored or Deus Ex. I would love to hear what you feel about Shale Bridge Cradle. Leave a comment below, leave a like, subscribe. Have a good day, my friends. Boulder Punch out.